Good evening. <clears throat> Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Maria Costa and I am your presenter for this course, Borrowing Money During the COVID-19 Pandemic, and is hosted by Berkeley Strategy Advisors, partners with the City of Sacramento. <clears throat> In today's time, bankers are changing their strategies right now and their methods of doing business and lending money. And it's strictly to ensure that your payback abilities are going to be accepted and this particular financing that you're trying to get from them. Um, yes, their methods and their uh, um, strategies have changed. However, banking are still in the business of lending money. Um, so we're going to uh, go through some uh, um, ways that they are executing their changes so that you can have a, uh, a feel of what's going on when you become, uh, when you become interested in, in borrowing money and that to be aware of what they're gonna ask for, uh, what documents are gonna be required, what, uh, what percentages of ratios as far as your CDRs and your, and your FICA scores and all these uh, um, uh, scores that they're gonna be requiring. I'm going to touch on some of them to let you understand where they're coming from. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, so here we are. Borrowing money during COVID-19 pandemic. So you want to borrow money and there's the banker there with his mask on, smiling with his teeth hanging out there. So yeah, and that's what they're gonna do if you don't bring in your documents uh, um, on, on time and, and orderly and balanced and, and they'll ask you to please come back when you're ready, okay? So uh, as I said, lenders are changing their, their, their strategies. Um, they're not changing their mission. They're still gonna borrow money. Not all of them are, are borrowing. Many of them are just uh, uh, lending money um, of uh, that are guaranteed by SBA, guaranteed SBA loans. Um, so commercial lending isn't really uh, uh, really activity activized right now. So um, so you have to know what banks, especially your your bank of account that you have a relationship with. I would start with them. Okay. So here are some tips that will help reduce the trauma of applying for a loan during the pandemic. But first. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Maria Casa, as I had mentioned um, in opening this presentation. I have about 35 years experience in business economic development with emphasis in financing. So my experience has provided me with um, knowledge and abilities to work with small, medium, and larger businesses in their development, um, and of course, their growth. Um, I've had a commercial lending experience as an underwriter. I wrote a lot of, uh, uh, um, I underwrote a lot of uh, loans and also I was bank manager, senior bank manager, senior underwriter. So I had a lot of experience in that field. Um, shortly after my, uh, pu my public uh, private uh, work experience, I joined the federal government. I was with them for about 26 years where I had attained the highest uh, civilian uh, grade level in that uh, year's period of about 26 years. Uh, two of my favorite positions that I had during the federal government was uh, working with the U.S. Small Business Administration as their district director of the Los Angeles district. 
uh, as well as the area director for the U.S. Department of Commerce in the LA District. Um, after my 26 years in the federal government, I uh, joined the uh, the uh, I joined USC, where I lectured for three to four years in accounting and finance best practices to an entrepreneurial graduate program. And currently I'm working with uh, California Manufacturing Technology uh, Consultants. It's a group um, that's uh, funded and partnered with the US Department of Commerce, as well with the state of California uh, to uh, assist uh, ma uh, manufacturers throughout the state of California to maintain their, their competitiveness nationwide. Um, and they are having uh, issues right now, just like any other businesses that the, uh, the uh, manufacturing industry has really taken uh, a, a real hit um, on all phases, just like everybody else, such as uh, customers. We've lost a lot of customers during this pandemic. Um, your supply chain, you've lost a lot of products, uh, uh, vendors that you cannot get your products uh, from them. So all this is, is affecting everybody. And that's when we're all working together and trying to, to get a, a happy meeting to get back on track. Okay. And if you have any questions, please feel free to just speak up. I think I'll, I'll mic up all the, uh, they're all open right now. If anybody wants to say anything, feel free to ask a question, raise your hand, uh, send me a little message and we certainly will accommodate you, okay? Now this is a di disclaimer, I'm not gonna uh, read it all, but all is saying that um, not to rush out right immediately after you see this presentation and sign on the dotted line, um, your, uh, uh, your dotted line on, on, on a loan that you want to go get. Uh, before you do that, um, make sure to uh, speak to um, uh, somebody, a professional person, your CPA, your attorney, anybody that can help you make that decision. So don't take these things uh, 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 as a Bible. Uh, they are tips for you to, to uh, work with and, and something that uh, will help you to get a loan. Okay, so general lending guidelines. That's something that we're going to uh, discuss and, and, and go over right now. And, uh, okay, just a second. That's blinding the screen, thank you. Anyway, um, general lending guidelines. And uh, this is from your perspective of a lender and as well as an underwriter, because this is the, the lender will process the loans and get, get it ready, but it's the underwriters that do all the, the, the work and, and the calculations to determine if you are credit worthiness and also to the likings of the lender. Each lender has a particular uh, uh, guidelines to meet, um, probably the same doc documents, but different ratios, different uh, requirements. And um, so you have to be familiar with what they're going to want. And you have to have a discussion with them but before you sit down with them. So uh, you're going to, we're going to go through lenders expectation. We're going to go through the universal business cash flow, um, which is, uh, which is, uh, includes the uh, EBITAT, uh, which uh, includes the, uh, your, you know, company's uh, bottom line, that's uh, earnings before interest, depreciation, and amortization. So that's what EBITAT is. After you go through all the, the expenses and everything, and all, and then you come out with your EBITAT um, and personal income and how it's calculated. We're going to go through that because we're going to ask you for that. Also, um, we're going to have a combined cash flow calculations, uh, business and personal, because they will ask you for both. And also, we're going to uh, talk about the uh, a DCR, which is debt coverage ratio. That's also as important as your FICO score. Uh, so don't forget that that is very important. This is something that you're going to have to uh, uh, know how to calculate so you can beat them to the punch. You can get it ready. You can you can um, develop this and say, I know what my EBITDA is already. They'll probably fall off their seat because nobody really knows how to work that. It's easy, it's simple, but nobody wants to take the time to understand it. So it's something that you might want to, you know, you might want to uh, uh, take a few minutes and, and get a copy of this uh, presentation. The presentation can be found on the website of, uh, of uh, the organization that I, I mentioned earlier, Berkeley Strategy Advisors. Um, that'll, that's probably where you uh, signed up for the course. And they have uh, all these lectures that are in courses outlined. So if you want to see that, it'll be there for you to uh, download it and, and look into it. 
okay? So, um, so we're going to talk about that uh, your uh, your uh, debt coverage ratio, just like we're going to talk about FICA scores. Like right? that's what in number eight on that piece of paper there. So, um, and talk about collateral. What do they want in, in in the sense of collateral? What are they going to ask from you? You know, what do they need? Uh, based on the amount of money that you're borrowing, that's what will determine your collateral. Okay, personal guarantees in addition to collateral. In addition to your debt cover ratio, in addition to your personal uh, FICA scores, they will require personal guarantees. Okay, and of course, with collateral comes security agreements, and that is the UCC one filings. And we'll understand. We'll go through that to let you know where that, how those are done, and and uh, how they're done. Okay, so let's start with uh, with. Uh, Oh, well, we're going to do another one here, lender's perspective, and that is um, number nine. So we're going to go to um, what the lenders want from you. They're going to ask for a balance sheet, and they're going to ask you, does it balance? I'm going to show you a sample of a balance sheet. I'm going to show you why it's called a balance sheet, because it balances the the, uh, the assets and and um, um and expenses and equities all balance one another. Okay, so it'll show you that example. Then you'll have a. Uh, then I'm going to show you a balance sheet ratio example of what the underwriter will calculate, because we're going to do. There's about five or six uh, that I noted on the ratios that they're going to ask for when they do get your documents, and they're going to calculate them. We're going to do one just to show you an example of probably the the, the debt to net worth, so you'll see what really is a is a valued uh, calculation for you to try to learn. Okay, so then again, example of ratios, debt to total assets, income statements, what will they ask you for? Cash flow statement, they're gonna ask you for that. And also a cash flow statement format I'm gonna show you. So you'll be familiar with what it's gonna look like and what's something that you should be prepared to, to explain when you go to see a lender. Okay, so. The next one is, um, okay, this is, uh, um, again, still expectations and needs. They're going to ask for a personal guarantee of anyone over 20% or more ownership of your business. That means anybody, um, including your, your spouse. If they own more than 21%, they will ask for a, a personal guarantee. During the, the, the CARES Act of uh, the PPP and, and the EIDL loan that, went uh, 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 that was really popular last few months and this still is you got till December 31 to get an idle loan but when it was when it started it was just the phones were ringing in every lender to try and get one of those loans and uh, through my connections and through discussion uh, of this particular loans um, people were putting 20 percent uh, other people that were part of their of their uh, uh, business um, and they were turned down because that 20% um, person that owned that business was not a citizen, was not a declared citizen, didn't have any papers. So they did not want to put that person as a guarantor because he, a guarantee, he couldn't guarantee, they couldn't guarantee anything. He wasn't from here. So they figured he'll, he would not be a good uh, a person to ask for, um, for a guarantee. So make sure that everybody that you have has 20% or more of your business are legal and able to be a, 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 a responsible guarantor for your loan, okay? You need to have three years of company uh, tax returns um, as well as three years down here for your personal tax return. And then if not filed in recent tax years, then internally prepared uh, detailed financial statements are accepted, okay? so. If, for instance, it's, it's like March or, or February of the following year, you have not done your taxes a year before, or if you have an extension for October, even then. So if you haven't done them, you have to let them know why you haven't. And then internal prepared detailed financial statements are accepted. Okay, so three years of personal uh, tax return, just like three years of your business tax return. Okay, your personal financial statements, and I'm going, to, I'm going to give you an outline as to what those personal financial statements you'll be required to submit. And then one year of company bank statements. Now, when I was underwriting some years back, and that was some years back, um, we didn't ask for one year of company bank statements. Um, maybe three, uh, uh, we didn't ask for 12, uh, one year, uh, maybe three months. 
um, maybe it depends on how big the loan was, it depends on uh, the, the purpose of the loan, but I see now more and more, they are asking for one year of company bank statements. So be prepared to have a one year uh, of bank statements, okay? Okay, so here is that EBITDA calculations that I talked to you. We're gonna we're going to also see a format of this because uh, while it sounds so um, so ominous, it really isn't. It's a calculation. Oh, you can get that from your financial statements. So it's uh, um, so you see here uh, what is it and how's it calculated. So this is how you calculate it. You get a uh, EBITDA is it measures the profitability of your company. So that's why the bank's going to ask for that. It shows liquidity, it shows the profitability of your business. So you start with your net income, your interest expenses, your taxes, depreciation, amortization, and then you get your earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. That's what this is all about. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, an example of that so that you can see that, it, you know, it just sounds more, like I say, mysterious when they write it like that. But if you see it, and I'm going to show you right now um, a format also, we're going to be seeing something like that. So let's go to the next slide, and then we'll go to a format of that. Um, the next slide here is uh, discretion. Now, that other one was for business, okay? That EBITDA was for business. This is the discretionary personal income, which is, means the same thing. It, it, it just, you know, it, it, it less, it's your personal income after income taxes. And then uh, less home mortgages or rent, installment loans, payments, credit card payments, and other, okay? Also, plus spouse's income, outside income, investment income. So if your spouse has any uh, uh, W-2s, 1099s, or any kind of income, that will be part of your personal discretionary funds, okay? Okay, now this is a sample. This is a sample of a discretionary personal income calculation, okay? And also, it has uh, um, it has uh, it has uh, everything outlined for you uh, here. This one here is done for three years, and it says all the wages, uh, all your wages and salaries, uh, including, uh, like I said, your spouses, and then um, and so then you have um, uh, unrelated uh, interest and dividends. Um, net rental income, um, new business income, and uh, any S corporation or any other income that you have, you put it there and other. So that's your total. That's money coming in, okay? Now outflows, which is money going out, that's your taxes, your real estate taxes, your mortgage, rent, uh, and this is, uh, this is um, the uh, line of credit, uh, uh, home equity line of credit, and then there's installment revolving, and then there's living expenses. And for your living expenses, you're allowed six thousand dollars per adult, okay, per spouse, and then three thousand per each child. So you don't have to go out and and and, and calculate anything. Living expenses, you just put six thousand for each of the spouses, and then for each child, you put three thousand dollars, and that'll be part of it. You don't have to go back and look what did I spend last year or anything. It'll be there. But all these other expenses and income, you need to go and check where you're getting it from and, and so that you can claim it um, uh, correctly. And don't forget, a lot of this will be probably in your income taxes, like your wages and everything. So be prepared when they call for a, a uh, uh, your, your uh, tax return. All this is going to have to match. And nowadays, now these years, the last few years, 10 years, they've been asking for your tax, your tax return. So that that will be coming up and they will ask you for that also. So um, once you get this and don't forget $6,000 for each adult and 3,000 for each child can be allowed in that line here, living expenses, okay? All right, all right, let's go. This is a, this is a, um, this is an example of a format of a combined cash calculation and a debt coverage ratio, okay? Now, this is uh, this is combined, the company and yours, okay? So here you go, here's the EBITDA. This is the bottom line of your EBITDA that you got and that one we just saw right here, when, uh, right here. This is where you, that bottom line is going to put, is gonna be put on, on um, this bottom, on this bottom line here. 
Okay, right there. Look at that. Your gross sales, all that's how much money the company made. Uh, your gross sales, okay, not net. Your gross sales and your EBITDA is 250. And then, um, and then you have um, uh, uh, owner's input, 15,000. That was your your that was your discretionary funds that you had. Uh, that goes right there because this is the business uh, funds and this is your discretionary funds. And um, so then you have adjusted cash flow is 265. All right. Adjusted cash flow. All right. So what do you have here now? So now you have here coming down. Oh, excuse me. Anyway, so your new loan. So you're doing all this for approximately uh, one. 160, $160,000, you're, you're borrowing money. So this tells me that all this work here is to borrow $160,000, okay? So here it is, a total 160, okay? So uh, you divide this by this, and you're gonna get, if you can see the bottom part of this, because I can't see the bottom, my, let me see if I can move this out of the way. Yeah, I can move it out of the way, here we go. Um, so if you see the bottom here, it says uh, down here is combined DCR. So it's 166, 1.66, 2.00, 1.88, 1 1.44. This is just adjustments, so you don't worry about this line. Uh, 1.44 and 228. So any say this is adjustments, that's that's not relevant right now. So so you have uh, uh, 166, 1. Point, uh, point, uh, 1.88. Uh, 1.44 and 2.28. Now, if you see that, it's the ratios are good because uh, it's a one one to one, and it and you have that your that's extra. So if anything's uh, it should be one to one. Anything oh anything under that, you are considered uh, high risk, and odds are you won't get a loan, even if you have the best um, uh, 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 FICA score. Because this is this is important as your FICA score, your DCS. Again, it's uh, it's uh, debt uh, debt coverage ratio. So you'll see that there, and it has to be over 1.1. And everyone under those line items, 1.66, uh, 1.88, 1.44, and 2.28, it is above the uh, the 1.1. So they figured that uh, if I was doing a uh, an underwriting process for this loan, it would agree with what I would want to see. So this is okay. So this is something that you can play with. If you get a copy of this, you can work it. Um, start off with that uh, EBITDA and see if you can come down with some figures from there and and uh, and prepare for this because this is something they will do. And if you could go in there ahead of time and have it ready, it's even uh, better for you. Okay. So. Um, Okay, so now let me put this out of my way so I can see a little better. We're going to talk about collateral. Okay, now collateral, it's a way to reduce the lender's risk. Okay, they want to see what am I going to get from you? What do you have that interests me to uh, support the, the loan I'm going to give you? So they want to make sure that you are uh, able to pay back the loan. Okay, so all assets of a company and cash proceeds. Uh, they're from sometimes called a plaster lien because they get whatever they want and just plaster their lien with it. Um, accounts receivable, advances made against a percentage of the accounts receivable, less allowances for bad debt. They're going to look at your accounts receivable. If it's in your business, you're going to have to see, you know, well, how much do they, uh, how much uh, um, are you getting in? Okay. But you'll have to make sure that those receivables are current. Some of them on your on your on your financial statement say, oh, they owe you they owe you one hundred eighty thousand, but it might not be correct because of that eighty one hundred eighty thousand, maybe only twenty five thousand is thirty days, maybe the other ones are sixty days, maybe another amount is is uh, ninety, and after that is ninety plus days. So your ninety plus days, they don't want to see this because they figure you're having problems collecting. Why are they going to take those extra uh, uh, um, risk? to put that as a collateral because you're not collecting them. So they are, the odds are they won't collect them either. So they want to see some accounts receivable that are current and that your customers are paying you and they're good customers that have been paying traditionally. And also your accounts receivable, less allowance for bad debt. Okay, so don't forget, um, bad debt means anybody is not paying you. What is the percentage of your bad debt? And they'll make, an, uh, they'll make a percentage of that. Say you're 
percentages is 5% of uh, non-collectibles, non then they're gonna take 5% off the top and that's what they're gonna consider, okay? Um, equipment, always when financing new equipment and usually that piece of equipment becomes uh, part of the collateral to hold on to that. There's gonna be a lien on that. And of course, uh, real estate, commercial investments and residential always require collateral, okay? <clears throat> so, in addition to collateral, yes, you have to give a guarantee. A lot of people think, oh my God, I'm giving collateral. They also want to guarantee. Yes, they do. They want to make sure they're going to get their money. Lenders may not require spousal guarantee. However, if a, a, pos, if a spousal is 20% or more owner of the business, personal guarantee is required. Just like I say, everybody over 20% ownership of a business will be required to uh, offer up a guarantee for the loan, okay? If spousal's portion of discretionary income is substantial, lenders may require them also, okay? Um, regardless of whether they're 20% or not. Um, so that should be discussed with your attorneys. I would, I, I would uh, uh, caveat that statement that it should be discussed with your attorneys before that's done, okay? Now, uh, guarantee um, today, guarantees today allow a lender to pursue both companies' assets and personal assets of guarantors uh, simultaneously and sequentially. So be aware of that. So they're gonna take it, you know, uh, now we're there, now we're after. Okay, here we go. So security agreements uh, uh, and UCC, uh, one's filing. Now, <clears throat> all the time they take a piece of equipment as, uh, as, your, as your guarantee uh, or as your, guarantee, as your guarantee for a loan, um, I would recommend that before they take it and before you offer it, make a list of all everything that you're going to be offering them because at the end, um, often, and I've seen it too much often in, at banks because here um, uh, it says here, oftentimes borrowers discover that the UCC1 lien filings have not been removed when past loans have been paid off. So you need to, one, when they're ready to give out collateral, uh, 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 collateral on your security, um, uh, security on your collateral, what you're gonna have to do is make a list of that, of what they're gonna take um, so that uh, you'll keep in mind that that's being held up by uh, a loan that you got. And that's not to say you can't borrow. There are some banks that will take a secondary uh, uh, lien on, on a piece of equipment. Uh, depends how far into the loan payments you are with that one, but they will, they will um, allow for that. They do that. I see that an awful lot. So, uh, but the thing is you can't sell that piece of property. So you always have to have it, uh, a list. If you want to start selling your assets or something, you can see, oh, I can't get rid of this because the bank has a lien on it. <clears throat> and that creates a big other, you know, ball of wax. So you don't want to deal with that. Make a copy of it. Not only make a copy of it for that purpose, but make a copy of it. So when you make that last payment on that loan, that they'll release that um, that lien from that from that machine or that asset. So you have to call them and let them know, hey, you know, uh, I paid that, and and I want to make sure that you release the lien on it. So follow up on that because you're going to make a list of all that, and then call them upon the last payment of it. Okay, by making the UCC filing, the lender records their rights as a holder of the collateral with the state. That's referred to as protecting their collateral. Again, they wanna make sure they're gonna get the money from you, that you're gonna pay them back. And by solidifying all this guarantee, collateral, your FICA scores, your DCR scores, they want to solidify to make sure that you are uh, a good risk, okay? So again, remember that um, you have to, uh, make a list of what you're, you're pleading for collateral. You also uh, uh, make sure that um, <clears throat> that when you make that last payment to uh, make a search on that uh, on the UCC1 filing and that it has been released from the lien of the lender, okay? <clears throat> this is your FICA score, okay? This is personal credit scores. And it says here, yes, even with a great FICA score, a DCR credit score, counts. So they will, like I say, they will get back to that uh, that uh, uh, debt credit ratio that, that we just went through. 
So those two are very important. Keep in mind, a lot of people don't know that, but it exists, okay? Lenders consider credit scores as a character indicator, meaning that if your credit score is low, they're gonna think that you've been very lax in prior uh, uh, borrowing, that they don't feel that you know you might be a, a, a good risk in this loan. And therefore you might have to, you will be turned down, but you might have to go borrow money from somebody else with a higher, uh, with a higher interest rate and that you don't want. Um, so uh, commercial bank scores uh, requirements are higher than most non-bank lenders, okay? So there's two. There are commercial lenders like your B of A, like uh, Bank of the West, like Chase, like uh, 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 Bank of America. All those are commercial lenders, okay? Um, but then you also have the, you have non lenders, non-commercial lenders. And those are the ones that don't have any savings accounts or checking accounts, they just do lending. There's a lot of reputable ones out there. Um, so like this statement is here, commercial bank scores requirements are higher than most non-lender uh, bank lenders. You might wanna check them out. They're in the directory. They're in the, just uh, go through your internet and look at for some of, make sure they're reputable. And one of the ways that I could tell you that they're re reputable, um, like a lot of the banks, uh, Bank of the West, um, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, Bank of America, Chase, they're all SBA preferred lenders. Um, not all lenders are preferred lenders, but the majority of them are. And so they're more or less reputable and that's who we normally go see. But on the non-bank lenders, you don't know who they are. So may, a, a lot of them are SBA preferred lenders also. So that's one way you could you could have a little more trust in them and to feel that they're a little more uh, reliable and respectable. So make sure before you run into a bank, a non-bank lender that they are reputable. That's important. And you can check if they are uh, uh, SBA preferred lenders, okay? Many of them are. <clears throat> and before applying for a loan, pull your credit score and check for accuracy. Uh, of course, Credit Karma is a good website to use uh, for that. Also, uh, my credit cards, uh, I have an app for them on my phone. And they periodically ding me and ring me and, and let me know what my score has changed or anything. So you can get that from them also. Pull down an app from them and they can give you a credit score on you. Nowadays with this pandemic, uh, all the credit uh, companies are giving you and providing you with a free, I think, monthly uh, credit score. So you might want to do that and make sure that uh, you get it and, make, and ask them if it's for free. But I understand they're giving it up for free because of this pandemic. Okay, so um, preparing your financial statements and other documents that they're going to ask you for. Okay, so these are some of the things they're going to ask you. Balance sheet, you have that in your business. Cash flow statements and income statements. They're going to ask you for that. And you're going to have to have three years of tax return. These are uh, financial statements uh, prepared for your, your three years tax returns. You should have the most recent balance sheet. Um, and income statements ready. And I mean, most current. If you're gonna go in there on uh, one month, you better have that the end of the month current because they're gonna ask you for a current one. Um, okay, lenders want to see accounts uh, receivable and accounts payable, uh, aging reports, meaning that if your accounts receivable, your your softwares always have a, a module for that. Um, to have uh, your, your, all your, if you have $150,000 of accounts receivable, 25, I mean, uh, They'll have a, a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day, and plus. So 25, I mean, when I say 25, I keep saying 20, say it's 100,000 and 25,000 are due in 30 days. So those are current, okay? And then say another 25 is they're due on, on, the, um, on the 60 days. And then another uh, 25 from, from the 90 days and, uh, and another 25 for the uh, 90 plus. So we have problems with the 90 plus and the 90 because those are old already, you know? So they don't want to, they don't even want to consider those. They don't, they only want to consider maybe the 30 and the 60 days. So they want to see an aging reports. So most, again, most banks, uh, most uh, softwares have that and you could just have them have your accountant or bookkeeper retrieve that report when it goes into your, into your uh, application of a loan, okay? Uh, internally prepared or prepared by your accountant. So in other words, you don't, you don't have to go get a CPA to do it. You can do it internally, a lot of these reports. Okay, so 
here is the balance sheet. We're going to talk about this balance sheet, okay? Now you see this little cat and the dog and the two little mice there trying to balance that stick. Well, that's how they want to see your balance sheet. They want to see it balanced equally across the board there. I want to show you one in a while and we're going to uh, uh, look at that right now, okay? So here you have your assets and liabilities, uh, equity, all that has to go across the board and it will balance, okay? Uh, does your equity earnings reconcile current equity, previous year's equity, and current income? All this has to balance, and I'm going to show you one right now, okay? Uh, do your accounts receivable and accounts payable aging balances agree with your balance sheet entries? In other words, you might have 30 days, 60 days, again, 90 days, and and 90 plus, and your balance sheet says you have 125,000 in there, but these four columns are only totals up to, to uh, 100,000. So you're missing uh, 25,000. So this is what they're asking. Does your aging of both accounts people, accounts people balance with your balance sheet? Okay, very important. Your accountant will know how to do that or your bookkeeper will know how to work with you on that. Okay, this is a this is a balance sheet, a sample. It's, uh, it's it's not detailed at all. It's a very basic one for you to understand or to uh, to uh, so that you can see what it consists of. It has your current assets, and it has uh, it has your current assets, and then all of your accounts receivable, which is a current uh, inventory, current um, everything that's going to be used within the uh, a year. So here you go and. Uh, finished goods, a total inventory, and then you have prepaid expenses. So total current assets, it's 80,000. You're telling the bank here that all this is going to be moving in a year, okay? All this is going to be moving in a year. This here, down here, your land, your building, it's their assets, but it's not going to be transferred into cash immediately. These are, you know, they're not going to be turning anything into cash other than products, maybe. But but that's not considered uh, current assets. This is only these here. And then here's our other to other current assets. Then you have total property. Then you have less cumulative uh, depreciation of your assets up here. Um, and then you have net fixed assets. And then that's net. That's uh, total less uh, less the depreciation. So you have net. Okay. So net fixed assets is there. That's your depreciation. And then total assets is one. 117, 117,250. So your current liabilities, again, current liabilities are right here. Anything that is going to be, um, uh, it's going to be uh, paid off within a 12 month period. This is why it's called current. Anything other than that, it's not current. This is deferred income taxes. And uh, then you have long term debt. Um, so it's total liabilities is 59. Uh, 5550, okay, 59,550. So you have your common stock and then you have your, your paid in capital. That's something that the comp that the president or somebody puts money in. And then you have retained earnings, okay? Retained earnings come from your from your um, P and L. Anything that you finish that month with profit and loss jumps into retained earnings. That's why it's equity because equity is showing this is what you made for that month or it, it, it accumulates every month it changes. If you got a loss for that month, it'll be a loss. If it, so it'll all be cumulative right here. So all that one and two totals up to $117,250. Okie dokie. All right, so this is a balance sheet sample. So you see that it balances, okay? All right, so balance sheet ratios are thinking are, are, are ratios that your bank will be uh, preparing once you give them the documents of your balance sheet. Um, so your ratios from your balance sheet are going to be debt to total assets, um, total liabilities, and total assets. And we're, I'm going to run that for you. We're going to make a sample of that one. Your working capital, current assets uh, divided by current liabilities. Quick ratios is asset plus at ash. Cash plus accounts receivable minus current liabilities. Then you have your accounts receivable, accounts payable, invoice days on hand. Days mean your aging of accounts. How many of that 30, 60, 90 plus days? And how fast is your inventory turning? They want to know. That's important. Is your inventory turning? Uh, if it's not turning, then there's something wrong. You have too much inventory sitting there and you're not moving it. And uh, that creates a, a, a big 
a sore eye with a banker when they see um, inventory not changing. You might have something in there that doesn't belong there. You got to get it out, um, sell it, but get it out because it's not moving. It's an artificial asset in your account. It's it's a, okay. Now this is a sample uh, uh, of a uh, debt to total assets that they will be doing. And then uh, look at this fifty nine thousand versus total liability and total assets. Okay, so let's go back to um, this here. Here, total liabilities is fifty nine. That's what you're gonna see there. And then you have total assets one hundred seventeen thousand. These two here are the two numbers that, the, that you will be uh, doing a, a, a ratio with. This is a good tool uh, to, to, uh, to remember what to do because they will check this, that this is gonna tell you if you're, uh, if, you're uh, if, you, if you have payback abilities, if you're a good risk or not. This, this particular tool is important for you to remember and to do it every so often. So that you can say, hey, you know, this is within the ratios that a bank's going to look at, and then, and this one here turns out to be uh, fifty percent almost. Okay, they have fifty percent of their debt over their assets, so that's fifty percent. What do you think? Let's see what it says here. The company's total debt represents about fifty percent of its total assets. The ratio is a gauge of how much total debt a company can incur and still cope without financial difficulties, okay? A high debt to asset ratio over 1%. So we're fine here. This is 50%. This is perfect. If I was doing this loan, that would be a, a, a ratio that I would accept, okay? Uh, this could mean that your company will, uh, if it isn't, if it's, if it's a, if, uh, a high ratio of 1% or more, that could mean that your company will have trouble borrowing money or may borrow money at a higher interest rate uh, than if the ratio were lower. Yeah, you could probably go out and get some hard money, which a lot of companies do when they when feel they have to. And sometimes it's worth it at that particular time. So that's something you have to discuss with your CPA, your accountant, or your partners. But at this point here, if I was doing this loan, that 50% sounds great. It fits within the margin of it's under 1%. So I would approve this loan if I had to. If I had to. So, okay. So we're going to check some income statements here and check out this here, what we have. Okay. So, um, okay. So this is a PL statement, okay? Income statement, also known as PL. Our profit statement. I like to call it a PL. Their income and cost consistent uh, 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 for the year to year. So they have, and it's not going to be consistent from year to year because this year was not a good year. So you have nothing to fall back to. No, it's not going to be consistent from the year to this year. And they'll understand that. The lenders will immediately understand that. Um, so they will see that it was a big drop in your in your income. Well, because you lost some customers. You lost uh, uh, not only customers, but you lost some uh, uh, a lot of your 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 products. You lost you lost uh, uh, vendors. Your supply chain changed dramatic, dramatically. So they are prepared to listen to that and to hear that. How do you calculate material costs? Beginning inventory, what you purchase, and ending inventory. That's what they want to see if it's moving. You have to take a perpetual inventory every month and do the adjustments on that. Um, so that you can uh, determine exactly, you got to move that inventory. And that's how it moved by doing some kind of inventory, doing the adjustments, and then your inventory changes. Unless you have a software that does that. Not many softwares that do that. Uh, expensive softwares do that. So you might want to check that out. Is your cost of goods consistent year to year? Again, it's not going to be consistent this year. Um, they might be a Percentage might be okay because you know your sales have dropped, yes, and, and your product as little as it went, your 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 cost of goods probably equal what you're saying. So that might be okay, but uh, all odds are it's not. Are all direct costs included in your cost of goods? Direct costs meaning your labor, your your rental for that place for your factory. Because if you have a, a, a building that's uh, I don't know how many thousands of feet, maybe 10,000 square feet, and your office is, is one third of that, while the other uh, uh, 75, or say it's one fourth, so the other 75% will go to your factory costs, cut your 
cut your 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 rent uh, to proportion your your percentage of, of your of your uh, space out in your factory, as well as your insurance, any labor that's working out there, anything your packaging, everything that goes into your product, that's cost of goods sold. Okay. So here we go. Um, then you have a uh, cost of goods. Okay. Are you making uh, are you making an operating profit on your cost of goods? Okay. So that's of course your your selling uh, general and administration costs. Okay. Sales general and administration expenses. Um, uh, so and be prepared to explain any spikes if it went very high. Why? Well, you know, um, I don't think we're going to have very many spikes this year because of the pandemic. But be prepared to discuss that also. And again, they're fully. Uh, knowledgeable of the uh, hardship that these businesses are going are having right now. So it's not going to be surprising to them at all. It shouldn't anyway. Um, that's why most lenders right now are not lending uh, 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 unless it's uh, SBA guarantee loans because of this change here, because of the risk. Um, so you just have, if you have a good relationship with your bank, you have the odds of uh, they you have the odds that they will listen to you, okay? And uh, let's see what do we have here. Cash flow, I guess. So we're going to talk about our cash flow statements now. Of what and how is it created? Let us start with your bank statements, for starters, okay? Keep in mind financial statements used and accrual me methods of accounting. Cash flow statements are based on cash in the bank, okay? So there's a difference. Accrual. And cash bases are two different things. Okay, uh, cash is when you get your when you get your sales right away. That's that's you get it right away. Uh, in retail, you know, you get your money right away. That's cash basis. But in a regular accrual based accounting, you know, you 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 sell your product uh, on the thirtieth of one month. Well, that stays there as income, but you're not going to get that money till the following month or the following two months. So that's an accrual basis. That's why you can count that as as as, uh, as receivable for that month that you bill them. It's when they don't show up for that month, they don't pay, then it becomes uh, 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 delinquent. Okay, so these are three um, possible um, in their small scale um, samples of what a, a cash flow looks like, your cash in, your cash out, and then you have the uh, the uh, the here the small portion of it. Let me get this over here. Then you have the cash position right here. So all the things, and I'm going to show you one um, filled out right now. I think it's good. No, it's not. Anyway, this is going to be a little bigger. So you have this one. This is this portion of it right here. Then you got one individual bigger here. So you can see them all different. So this here for each month and total cash available. So you have your cash sales, sales on credit and in collections and loan injections. So you have all this total cash. So then you have all your expenses, every single expenses that you had for that cash flow period. It cannot be a year. It has to be maybe right now, a lot of people are asking for cash flow statements weekly so they'll know where their money's going. So I would recommend you do it in a couple of weeks. The bank's gonna ask you to, to tell them for maybe 15 days to, to two weeks. So make sure for sure that, you, uh, that you're following up on that, okay? That it is current. Okay, now here's your your reconciliation. You have your cash, your cash in, your cash out, and your cash position. And again, it has to be current and it has to be um, uh, factual, okay? Because they will know that because they're going to check all this with your all your other bank, your your financial statements. They're going to check to see what your aging looks like, and they're going to see well, how are you saying that you're going to get cash uh, in uh, of a hundred thousand dollars? When your 30 day or 60 days is only 75,000. Um, so they, they can determine whether this is not accurate or if it is accurate. Um, so make sure that your figures are accurate because you're going in there for a loan. And it's something that, you know, you want to make sure you don't want to, you know, come back and say, well, it didn't work out or something. And, and, and they might say no to you, but you got to ask them why specifically was it declined so that you can work on it. On a, for another bank or another place, or change that one and let them know I could fix that, you know, uh, uh, legitimately and uh, and um, and not and not uh, very practical. You might be able to change it because that might have been an error. But make sure that all those uh, ask them why are they declining it, and and then because of that letter will help you uh, redevelop it again. Okay, and the odds are they might they might check it out for you. Okay, um, unless it's it's your it's your uh, 
FICA scores that you know they're not going to change. And even that you could you could argue with it because uh, certain things weren't weren't supposed to be. That's why you're supposed to check your your bank uh, your credit report before you take that uh, your loan in, so that you'll know what to look for. And ask them what what credit score do you look for? Are you looking for? So that you'll know what, what to look for yourself. See what your credit score looks like, and work with your credit score people. You know, and a lot of them will help you uh, fix it. They do. Okay. So, in summary, you should now have some understanding of your financial statements and what an underwriter, your lender, will look for in determining your payback ability and seeking a loan. So again. Make sure you understand these statements. Make sure that the tools that you did in 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 this, as, in uh, in doing the ratios are are available for you to do that ratio yourself, and and ask them. You know, um, sometimes and it, it's very universal is the ratios that that you saw today. You're not going to see much difference there, but uh, they'll ask you for more detailed information. Okay, so I want to thank you for joining us today. And I hope that if you need any further information, um, feel free to call me, here's my number. And again, uh, if you go into the Berkeley Strategy Advisors webpage, uh, website, you could see these, um, these particular courses are outlined there. And if you wanna pull down any of this stuff there, it's there for you to, to download and uh, prepare yourself for, for a loan uh, in these uh, crucial times we have right now. So I wish you a lot of luck, success in your business, and hopefully uh, your loan will go through. Thank you.